Well, I don't know where to start because this is a, at one level, it's a very large philosophical question. Uh, and I have answered it uh, in my work in the following way. A society doesn't exist in a vacuum. It has a certain character. It has a certain moral identity, fuzzy, but nevertheless some kind of moral identity. And in so far it has a moral identity, it has what I call operative public values. Those values in terms of which it conducts its affairs and which are embodied in its institutional practices. That is the starting point. We don't start with tabula rasa. We start with those values that are there. There is no uh, uh, way, other way of uh, discussing those values, of arriving at those values than through a, a democratic dialogue where we, try to where we try to persuade each other. And my argument is that there are certain values for which we can give fairly compelling reasons. We might be able to argue that these values have a universal relevance in which, and we talk about human rights and so on. Or we might say, well, we don't want, we can't, or we don't wish to claim universal validity for those values, but at least we wish to argue that we in this country are persuaded by those values and intend to organize our lives around that. I mean, that would be my short answer. I can imagine a counter, uh, a rejoinder to that, and I would be able to come to that as well. But this is broadly <laughs> what I would, what I, where, where I would stop for the time being, unless you want to come back. On the uh, question of British identity uh, and rural areas and so on, uh, again, one can handle it at various levels. Uh, I'm not interested in, I mean, rural areas will have a local identity, and that identity would be the building block of national identity in the same way that I was giving examples of London or Bradford or whatever. The important point we want to make uh, uh, at the philosophical level is as follows. When we talk about being a British, you can mean two different things. You can either abstract away, strip away different identities and try to arrive at some kind of abstract universal saying Britishness means, you know, being committed to Britain or whatever. Or you can recognize it as what Hegel would call, and I hope I can use that name in this gathering, a concrete universal, where identity is not abstracted away from differences, but incorporates those differences within itself. So, one could say, I am a British Muslim, or I am a British Indian. This would mean that I define Britishness in such a way that it leaves enough space for my Indian identity. You might call it hyphenated identity or uh, whatever. In Britain we don't very much talk in terms of hyphenated identities, but we embody this hyphen into the concept of Britishness itself, so that I could be, I'm British, but at the same time the Britishness is so capacious as to include the Scots, the Welsh, the Indians, the Hindus and Muslims and so on. There was one question about school curriculum. I think I have missed one or two other questions. But there was school curriculum. I'd, again, I don't know where to start because I wasn't talking about it. Uh, I mean, we have a, a long chapter in the report, and some of us have written about multicultural education. Uh, now, is that the, what the questioner wanted me to, to answer? <coughs> Multi well, where does one start? I would say two things. First of all, multicultural education is not just about curriculum. It is about the kind of ethos you create in the school. So that once you enter the school, you already imbibe a certain atmosphere. Atmosphere where diversity is recognized, valued, cherished, and so on. Hmm? Ethos through the composition of the staff. Ethos through the kind of uh, ceremonies, daily events that take place. I mean, this will be one aspect of multicultural education. Content is a small part of it, I'll come to that in a minute, but multicultural in the sense of creating a certain kind of ego. In terms of content, I uh, wouldn't think of multicultural education as simply kind of Cook's conducted tour of every part of the world. Basically, and I, I, I see multicultural education, apart from a certain amount of information that you might have about other cultures who have come to settle in your midst, basically it is about recognizing that my own view of life, or my own way of life, is contingent and that difference is imaginable, that things can be different. 
Once you begin to recognize that, it opens a lot of doors to you. And this I would take as a starting point. So that, for example, I would see a good multicultural education as one, where a 10-year-old boy would be taught, let's say, for a term or a year, the history or geography of one other country than his own. And just to immerse himself into the history of that country would get him to recognize that normal activities of daily life can be conducted very differently and can be justified equally strongly as his own. Now this recognition that things can be different and that difference doesn't imply pathology or deviation. The equal recognition of the legitimacy of differences, that to me is the essence of multicultural education. How you achieve it? I mean there are different theories about it. But I would say this is the basic goal. Thank you. I, I'm constantly going to run out of time if we go for another round. So I, I suppose what I want to ask you is published a report 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the world's moved on. Things have changed. Um, what, what should be our priorities in the next period during this parliament, for example? Uh, you mean promote polit political priorities? Political priorities. What, what, what should happen in the next three, five years? And what, and what should we be doing about it? You mean me or the well, in general? Us. <laughs> maybe, suggest, maybe, maybe some suggestions for government. Well, well, yeah, I would want, want to do two things. I am increasingly beginning to realize, I don't know if the High Commissioner or my good friend Bob would agree, politicians are a very muddled lot. I think their capacity to think in a longer perspective or to define the issues in an intelligent manner is extremely limited. It is from one crisis to another. Uh, I mean, if Iraq, I feel very strongly about, but if any, in, if in any other walk of life, if a politician had handled his business in the same way in which the presidents and prime ministers have handled our foreign policy or Iraq, they would have been sacked. But in politics, you can get away with all kinds of things. So the first thing for me, increasingly, I'm beginning, I'm beginning to realize as I sit in the uh, Lords and, and watch what's happening, is how little people have thought through the issues that they are dealing with. They are prisoners of a certain language, which they have inherited. They never step back and ask, is this the language in which I want to formulate the question? Are these the assumptions? Uh, what are the assumptions I bring to my subject? Anything that you do, whether it's education policy or whatever. First thing, Bob, therefore, I would want to insist is for us to be able to anticipate large questions that are coming up on the horizon and start thinking about them as deeply as we can. I feel very worried about, as I say, the role of religion, uh, which is coming up in a big way. Nothing to do with Muslims only, Christians. The big society is going to bring religion in a very big way so that they will function, they will take on more and more of the function. What do we do? Should the secular state enter into partnership with religious institutions? And if re these religious institutions then say, we will, or we will privilege people of our own faith, as faith schools have done, what would be your response? So the first thing I would want to do is to get some kind of intellectual clarity about the issues. Having done that, then obviously I would think it uh, the job of all of us, concerned citizens, to make sure that certain lines which we recognize as right are fought for. Now in the field of race, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Claire, uh, in her opening remarks, talked about how far we need to go. I, mean, I didn't want to go through that, but I, uh, initially I thought I would spend the whole lecture, 40 odd minutes that you had given me, taking you through statistics about educational achievements and economic achievements of different groups and who is falling behind and who is not. Then I thought it was uh, about PowerPoint, which and I'm, I'm technologically illiterate, so I didn't want to use PowerPoint. And it will also be rather too academic and boring. Uh, but if one went through all that, you would see that some communities are stuck in a cul-de-sac. 